and it's with Anne Archer. Hi Anne, I can see you there. And Louise Cowan as well. Hello. And they are going to be talking about, I'm going to read this out for you, articulating teaching and learning partnerships and illustrating skills profession, progression even, sorry, for maximum impact and engagement. So without further ado, I shall hand you over to Anne and Louise. Thanks, Biddy. I think we could work on shortening that title. So just bear with me when I share my screen. Okay, um, so my name's Anne Archer and this is Louise and we're Assistant Liaison Librarians at Newcastle University. Um, and we're going to talk to you today about something called a Working in Partnership Agreement, which we developed back in 2018 now, seems a long time ago. But we're going to look at um, what we've done since, um, over how we've added to it, how we've adapted it and changed it in, in the light of COVID. And what a working partnership agreement briefly is, but we'll go into it in more detail, is that we wanted to look at a more effective way um, of how we could work with both our academic staff and students to develop their information literacy skills. And I think the lovely moderators are going to put some links in the text um, as we go along. Um, I'm going to try to demo and go back in and out of some websites, but it might be easier that you want to follow along yourself on your own laptops or um, devices or um, access it later as well. Okay, so the context. Um, why did we feel like we needed to make um, this um, working in partnership agreement? Um, as often is the case in these situations, there wasn't really one main reason and lots of contributing factors. Um, firstly, we've historically, as a liaison team, had really inconsistent engagement with our academics in terms of organising and delivering teaching and embedding it into modules. Um, so we really wanted to create a level playing field for all academics and all students um, to show them what we could provide in terms of information literacy um, and also how we could work together to support and develop their information literacy skills as well. Secondly, we're being asked more and more, as I'm sure lots of you are, um, to measure and communicate our impact. And obviously we do that on a national scale with data that we all often do. But we really wanted to do that more on a daily kind of basis um, and look at our impact of our teaching. So we really wanted a measure to, to base that um, analysis and impact from. And lastly, the main factor was that Newcastle University back in 2018 created a new vision um, and a new university vision, a new strategy. And as part of that, the education strategy grew out of that and a new graduate framework. And we just saw it as a great opportunity um, to really demonstrate um, how we could, you know, yeah, talk to that strategy, how our teaching could relate to it. Um, and we also wanted to create um, a checklist for students really, as they go off into their next stage of their careers and, and talk to employers at job interviews or elsewhere, um, how they could then articulate, articulate their information literacy skills to those employers, um, whether like um, current or future as well. So what on earth is a, a working in partnership agreement? Um, very good question. Bear with me as I try and share my screen and it could go drastically wrong, but we'll give it a whirl. Can everybody see that? Um, so it's made up of two parts. And the first part is basically, we wanted to articulate what we could do as a liaison team, um, what the academic staff could do. And then finally, what the students could do in partnership with us um, to develop those information literacy skills. And it's not rocket science, it's very um, what you would expect, it's best practice, um, it's um, what we know pedagogically works well. Um, but we really wanted to be quite clear about roles and responsibilities to try and help um, clear up some of those inconsistencies that I talked about before. So that's kind of part one. Um, part two, see if I can get it up. Part two is here, so it's our student development progression document. Um, and as you can see, it's very much an outline, an outline of what um, we would expect to deliver at different stages. 
So we've divided up into finding, evaluating and managing information. And you can see down the side, we've got stage one, stage two and stage three. So this is really for our undergraduate programmes, not really looking at postgraduate programmes. Um, obviously, every module is different. Every student is different. Every programme is different. So we're not suggesting that you pick this up or the academics or students pick this up and put it into their um, current programme or where they're at. Um, particularly like subjects like law or medicine, um, you know, students have to up speed um, much more quickly on some of these information literacy skills than other programmes. But we really wanted again to create a baseline that students could refer to, that academics could refer to, and that they could actually see that layering up process of how we would build these skills in, um, you know, through those years, because often, often the academics and the students do understand that they just think an hour stage one is all that you need um, and they don't see how it could be built up and integrated into their work as well. We wanted to use Bloom's taxonomy as well to be reflected in this, um, not only from a pedagogical type of view, but also for a practical point of view for our lesson plan. So for example, we can easily copy and paste this and put it into a learning outcome for a lesson plan, which really kind of eases our um, yeah, ability to keep um, making sure that we're on track and we're delivering what we should be at what stages as well. Um, Louise is going to just now share and talk about the feedback from the academics that we got and um, when I just bring that screen back up. Yeah, so once the documents were live on our website, we looked to gather some initial feedback from school library reps and employability leads within faculties. We sent out emails detailing the aim of the working partnership document and its links to the graduate framework and also took the documents to meetings and had face to face discussions on their content and structure. We received a lot of um, positive responses, as you can see on the slide, uh, with the academic staff clearly seeing how the documents could not only benefit the development of the skills modules that we ran, but also aid the embedding of skills across the programme degree course. Um, we um, academics also provided a lot of constructive comments that have been helping us to develop this offer further. Happily, many of the initial changes that were suggested were things we'd expected. Um, we, were able to, we were able to make the improvements quickly after receiving the feedback. So, for example, as you saw on the website, we were able to translate the student development and progression document into a table format pretty quickly. Um, we added a link to the new graduate framework once it was made live. In the future, we're planning to directly link key aspects from our documents to the graduate framework so the schools can more clearly see how certain elements from that align. Anne's going to go into a bit more detail now about how we've embedded some of this in practice. Yeah, so you might have seen from the slide before, one of the academics suggested, it wasn't just one, actually quite a few, um, that we would be helpful to provide examples of a typical session, um, which made complete sense to us. So we created an embedded skills in practice page, kind of outlining example lesson plans um, for each stage, broken up with quotes with our, from our academics who we'd worked with collaboratively before. Um, I'll just try and share that with you now. So again, you can get a feel for what actually, um, it actually looks like. So as you can see, there's different types of um, lesson plans on here. We have interactive lectures. We've got workshops on here as well for the, the different stages kind of going through. Um, you can also see we try and cover a lot of the different student progression documents. So some sessions will cover like finding, evaluating and managing information. Some will zoom in on finding and um, so there's a range of different um, options again for the academics just to visually see um, what we can offer and um, going down to the bottom we kind of grouped our online learning materials together and um, I don't know about anybody else we often find our academics forget what we have or they don't know where to find them or you know lots of academics don't know what we do have so we're trying to group them together into a really kind of easy um, way for them to access and you can see we've got a range of different resources here from kind of dissertation resources through to our interactive search planners um, and also like other video content as well um, alongside that. We also did um, other kind of um, initiatives that we created and Louise is just going to talk to you about, about some of those. Yes, yeah, so uh, an additional online learning resource that we created since the launch of these documents is our digital self-assessment tool. We have two versions, one tailored towards undergraduates and one for postgraduate students. It was inspired by our student development and progression document and the tool aims to encourage students to engage with their own information and digital skills development. We'd already trialed something similar um, in a postgraduate library module with the help of a learning technologist, 
and having found it really effective, we were keen to create more generic versions that would be suitable for wider audiences. So these are just short 10 minute reflective quizzes that allow students to both identify strengths in terms of um, current information literacy skills they have, and then also help them to create a plan of what they need to work on. We can embed the skills checkers in our VLE um, canvas and also um, they're embedded on our student facing academic skills kit website so the students can access them in a lot of different ways. In terms of engagement and impact so far, we found that the documents have already helped us to build bridges and open new doors. So for example, for the first time, we've been able to initiate program level dialogue in several new areas, including the schools of history, law and computing, which has allowed us to really shape the curriculum at an early stage. So history, for example, have been undertaking a review of their curriculum and the coordinator of the review had found the student progression and development document particularly helpful in mapping out some of the skills students will need at each stage of their degree. As a result of that, the library were invited to the History Teaching Away Day, which provided further opportunities for us to develop our relationship with those academics and demonstrate the impact that our support can have. On a more modular level, the skills outlined in the student development and progression document are reflected in a new stage one biosciences um, academic and professional skills module, both through the embedded library sessions that we lead, but also in following sessions on scientific literature, and referencing and, and scientific writing that the academics lead themselves. In faculties where our value has not always been recognised, having this concrete item that highlights what we do has made conversations around the support we can provide a lot more effective. So this is especially true in the creative disciplines where we've been able to have discussions around how academic skills can sit alongside more creative practice. We've also been able to share the documents with other services, such as careers and the learning and teaching development service at Newcastle, who can help us further promote our offer to faculties. The learning and teaching development service, for example, are involved in curriculum reviews and technology enhanced learning projects in schools and can highlight key areas where our support might have a beneficial impact. They're also redeveloping their academic practice courses and we're having conversations with them around how we can promote and embed our working and partnership ideas in their sessions with new academics. So what's happened since COVID struck um, us all? Um, well, actually our working and partnership documents really kind of stood us in good stead um, to help us develop um, you know, the challenge of creating and switching to online learning quite quickly. So we um, used um, our working partnership agreement and also the university's um, education resilient framework, which they introduced at the start of this um, academic year to address um, COVID um, issues. Um, as a basis to create this supporting flexible learning web page. I won't demonstrate it because um, most of it's captured on the screenshot, but you can have a look for yourself at a later date or now if you want to follow along with me. Um, so the page kind of um, looks and includes a, a quite a range of different types of materials, um, things that we're able to um, deliver for the students asynchronously. And some of these could be embedded into our VLE, um, some of them are standalone and, and, and can be used in, in that way. For instance, our Canvas section, which is the top left hand corner on your screenshot, um, we have links here off to Canvas Commons, which is basically a repository of Canvas materials. And we've got um, examples in there for academics to actually see so they can see what we can provide, which was really useful. We've got lesson plans on there. And yes, they're, they're really useful for learning outcomes, but I think what was really helpful for the academics was to see how we break down our content um, asynchronously um, and how we um, would deliver that. So whether it was text or audio or video or whether it would be more applicable to do a quiz or another interactive activity as well. So they could get the scope of the sessions that we we're gonna deliver. We also have a, a programme of study across all three stages document, which was very much based on that student progression um, outline that I showed you before. And we tailored this to different um, um, programmes, obviously, but we used this at a basis and it was great, you know, back last summer to start to have conversations about where we would fit into their programme, whether it's a new programme or the reviewing programmes, and especially in this COVID kind of world in the pandemic and what was possible, what was, wasn't possible. The page um, also helped us to pull together recorded lecture materials, as you can see, and we were also able to include other interactive tutorials that we built and um, things like we built like an evaluating tutorial in LibWizard that we'd um, used elsewhere, but now we could showcase those resources again. So again, this page acted as a kind of um, a repository and a place like a one stop shop that the academics could look at um, and they found it really useful. 
Um, and as a result, we actually attracted much more um, interest um, this year. I mean, we always embed into a lots of different modules anyway, but certainly um, the, the just traditionally where we've not been able to have access before, um, we've now provided content to um, different programs and into different modules. So what does the future hold? So our next steps is to continue our promotion of these documents and the web pages to academics through the usual channels, to newspapers, uh, newsletters, sorry, and meetings, action plans, social media, and through university events such as the Learning and Teaching Conference. We're also looking to develop case study examples from early adopters to help showcase the benefits of working with us in partnership. And of course, following the sudden changes to all the teaching and learning last year, we're also hoping to collaborate with academic staff in reviewing the lessons learned from online teaching this year so that we can develop a mixture of non-synchronous, synchronous and face-to-face -face options for the coming academic year. And this will also include a review and an update of that supporting flexible learning page that Andrew showed you. Eventually, we're aiming for these documents to form the basis of a booking system for teaching that will make the process more considered and consistent across all of the schools. And that's it from us, so if any questions have come in. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, okay, um, really interesting to hear about that as, as an academic. I love the easier the better for academics. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, sorry if there's any other academics out there, um, because, um, I, you know, I think that actually helps helps them to engage um, and, and work in partnership. So that was really good to hear. So uh, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm starting with a question that is actually from me. So uh, I'm really interested in your skills checkers and I'd love to know, um, do you find the students engage with the skills checkers? Um, how, you know, what, how, how do you encourage them to actually use these, these skills checkers and take responsibility for their own development as it were? Louise, do you want to answer? Yeah. Um, we've been trying to embed them within the campus modules this year. Um, obviously, we've only had them really going this year. So trying to embed them in those at the beginning and the end to get them to think about the skills before they start and when they finish. Um, we, we still need to look at the stats for how that's been going this year to see whether they actually have. Um, but hopefully, <laughs> Yeah, it's always a real challenge, I find, you know, yeah. that, that that is the, you know, you create all this amazing stuff and then it's trying to get the students to actually engage. But I guess that's where the partnership with the academics is a really yeah. good way to actually, you know, particularly with induction, yeah. uh, you know, to get people on board. So, uh, sorry, that was me uh, nipping in with my own question. So now I'm going to go back to the other question. So um, Claire's put, how easy or difficult is it to provide digital literacy skills catering for various levels of competency and degree level? Yeah, that, that's, that's always a challenge, I think, with any teaching that you do. Um, I mean, I, I started out as, as a primary school teacher and differentiation is a challenge regardless of level, I think. So it's, it's a case of trying to pinpoint where their prior learning is going to start and then making sure that you have material that's going to um, provide extension for those who want to explore a little bit further and then make sure you've also got support in place whether that might be an extra member of staff or um, a kind of um, a structured list of instructions that people who aren't sure can follow rather than using their own examples um, so yeah it's just thinking about that ahead I think having a lesson plan for me is always the most important thing in the world because you can think about those kinds of issues that might pop up so the, the idea of teaching skills is really important here, isn't it? Okay. And um, uh, Claire's also asked, have there been any, uh, has there been any networking with other academic libraries in the development and sharing of information and skills? I think we, we, we're quite active as a team and we are connected a lot. So yeah, certainly things have, um, you know, developed, you know, collaboratively as well, bounce ideas of people. We haven't, we have, talked about this before at different conferences and elsewhere and we haven't had anyone who said they've done it before and um, lots of people interested in asking us that we're about to think about it or do it so we've been in people have been in touch and said they've used ours as a springboard and um, so I'm not aware of other people having done it in a formal way I think Sunderland may have done some things as well I think um so yeah we we're just keen to keep evolving it really it was a starting point to try and level the playing field 
mm. because there's some you know academics will book us way in advance and we're a small team and we want to level the playing field for everybody to have the chance and all those students to have the chance so I think we're quite unusual as a team we embed into lots of modules yeah a lot of university don't libraries I think I think they have more standalone sessions where we we don't really we kind of embed Okay, yeah, it's interesting. Right, we've got um, one more question, which um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to see. I think it's a question. So um, you might have answered this, but we'll, I'll just have a read. So it says, could the skills checkers be used also as a university staff resource? <laughs> Bearing in mind the staff, um, uh, or are they just geared to students? Um, because I think this is yeah coming from somebody at another institution. Um, they're trying to work out how to find the level of digital skills within their workforce. So have you con contemplated um, using it for staff? Um, not so far. Um, I mean, the, the ones we've designed have been really aimed at either undergraduates or postgraduates. But I, I suppose there wouldn't be a reason why the postgraduate one couldn't be used with staff. Um, yeah. it, it would be similar kinds of skills, um, but it's it's definitely more information literacy rather than wider digital skills mm. but yeah could definitely similar kind of approach could be taken well it's interesting i suppose particularly from a information literacy point of view in that we can we assume all academics are the same again but they're not necessarily so um you know yeah interesting one there and someone's just tried the skills checker um, and they think it'd be really helpful for groups of healthcare staff that they're currently working with. So they're really pleased you've shared that. So thank you very much. And uh, it's 18 minutes past, so I'm going to bring that to a close. So thank you both of you. It's lovely to see you, um, if not in person on the screen and, and really interesting um, what you've had to share um, and this idea of embedding skills um, and, and merging, you know, particularly for academic libraries, merging what academic libraries are doing with the, the teaching and trying to get the two as a sort of cohesive whole is really important. So thank you, Anne, and thank you, Louise.